Hello, everybody. Let's do some news. A villager's lawyer wants her client arrest thrown out claiming it was based on an improper traffic stop. Greg Don Wojcik, 64, who lives in the Lee Villas in the village of Marsh Bend, was arrested May 7 by Lily Lake Police on a charge of driving while license suspended. Seems cut and dry to me. So, they're going to go to court and try to get that conviction thrown out. We'll see. The lawyer said, there's a statement here, Mr. Wojcik had not committed any traffic infractions. I guess they're looking for probable cause to pull him over. That could be anything. Uh, or did he violate the traffic laws or criminal laws in any way prior to being stopped? She contends that because the traffic stop was improper, no information obtained during the traffic stop should be allowed in the prosecution of her client. The prosecutor's office opposes Grossman's motions. Well, of course. This well-established law enforcement has reasonable suspicion for an investigatory stop of a vehicle when law enforcement first determines the registered owner of said vehicle does not have a valid driver's license. Assistant Attorney Robert Underkofler III wrote in a response to Grossman's motion. A hearing on the motion is set for Thursday morning in Lake County Court. Villager has won early termination of his probation after leaving the scene of an accident. Last week, a judge signed off on the early termination order for 73-year-old John Cooney of the village of Lake Deaton. He completed 25 hours of community service, which he had the choice of buying out of a rate of $10 an hour. His six month of probation was terminated early thanks to his community service. He was also fined $366 in order to pay $50 for the court of prosecution. Cooney had been driving a red Nissan Murano SUV on June 19 on State Road 44 when he hit two traffic signs and damaged them, according to the arrest report. A witness provided information about the crash to law enforcement. Cooney was cited for leaving the scene of an accident and careless driving. In July, he landed in jail after skipping a court date in connection with his charge of leaving the scene of an accident. In 2021 incident in which he allegedly stole jewelry and medication from the home of an estranged girlfriend, he was free on bond from connection of that crime. A villager asked the judge for his freedom after an illicit visit to a neighborhood pool. William Scott Reagan, 63, who lives in Alexandria Villas in the village of Bel Air, has been held without bond since August 17th at the Sumter County Detention Center. He was jailed after a warrant was issued for a violation of his community control. He is due in court this week in a bid to win his freedom. Reagan's is represented by attorney Andrew Moses, known the villager for his defense of a man who left a woman for dead when she fell from a golf cart he was driving. By the way, they got it done that didn't live here. Reagan's probation officer went to his home at 3420 Roanoke Street on July 26 after he was sent home early from his job at the Back Porch Restaurant at Mulberry Grove Plaza. The terms of Reagan's community control allowed him only 30 minutes to transit in departing for and returning from his job at the restaurant. At all other times, Reagan's was required to be home under court order house arrest after his conviction in 2019. Gun threat in the Right <laughs> around about. I'm sorry. What are you doing? Drive right around about going, I'll shoot you next time around. I'll get you next time around. <laughs> you nut. Just so you know, there's an update to that story. I don't want to read two of them di at different times. It gets confusing for you guys, I know. He actually won his um, his court case there. They did let him out to go home. I got a, a pretty good slap on the wrist from the judge. Yeah. A woman spotted at a CVS pharmacy in the villages was arrested with illicit drugs after a traffic stop. Molly Marie Neitlinger, 46, of Leesburg, was parked at about 10.30 p.m. Monday night at the CVS parking lot on County Road 466 in the villages near the villages high school. A deputy ran a license plate of Neitlinger's silver 2006 Mazda and found the vehicle's registered owner has a suspended license. Neitlinger got into the vehicle, drove away, and was pulled over at County Road 466 and Villages Campus Circle. Neitlinger told the deputy she knew she was going to get pulled over. A computer check revealed that she had been stopped August the 18th for the same offense. A search of the vehicle turned up drugs. 
Neidlinger had a prescription for the brewer, whatever, Jesus. A deputy found that Neidlinger was already on probation on a charge of theft in Marion County. In addition, she had been charged in 2021 with stealing a necklace from a boutique at Lake Sumter Landing. She was taken into custody and charged with drug possession, driving while license suspended. She was booked without bond, Sumter County Detention Center, due to the probation violation. You guys watch my news every Friday and everything. Look at that picture. Look familiar? Looks familiar to me. I've seen that I've seen that face before. A village of Summerhill man demanded to speak to his lawyer during a drug arrest prompted by speeding on US 301. Sean Howard Brennan, 49, who lives at 3325 Shelby Street, was at the wheel of the Black Dodge Challenger when he was pulled over running about 70 miles an hour in a 45 miles an hour speed zone at about 3 p.m. Saturday, according to the arrest report. The Buffalo, New York native said he was not paying attention to the speed limit. Obviously. A check revealed he did not have a valid driver's license. God, that's like three in a row. Jeez. The officer told Brennan the odor of marijuana had been detected coming from the vehicle and Brennan began to sweat and became very defensive. He said he and his female passenger did not smoke marijuana. I'm sure that cop never heard that before. Police wanted to search the vehicle, which prompted Brennan to demand that he speak with his lawyer. After several warnings, Brennan reluctantly exited the vehicle. At that point, he admitted that there was marijuana in the car and pleaded not to go to jail. Search of the vehicle turned up three and a half grams of marijuana, two marijuana grinders, two smoking pipes and rolling papers, and multiple burnt marijuana cigarettes. He was arrested and went to the Sumter County Detention Center and released after posting a $2,000 bond. An impaired driving suspect from Pennsylvania was arrested at Spanish Springs Town Square. David Pinka, 65, who listed a local address on the historic side of the villages, was driving a sport utility vehicle with Keystone State license plates in the wee hours Saturday morning when he failed to come to a complete stop at a stop sign at Main Street and Alvarez Avenue. He was driving on a Pennsylvania driver's license. Pinka's eyes appeared to be bloodshot and his speech was slurred and raspy. He participated in field sobriety exercises and his performance indicated he was driving impaired. Pinka told police he had consumed a glass of Yingling Lager at the Orange Blossom Hills Country Club. He also said he had taken and had three hits from a marijuana cigarette. <laughs> you know, I can tell you every, every citizen in this country does not have to provide evidence against himself. <laughs> I just wouldn't say anything. Okay. Project-wide advisory committee on Tuesday approved a bid of $126,756 for the reconstruction of the windmill and water tower at Brownwood Paddock Square. However, committee members made it clear that they want to be kept apprised of the total cost of the project. The original cost of the demolition reconstruction was estimated to be $225,000 with funding to come from residents living south of County Road 466. I have an update for that, just for you guys. Right? Yeah. Let me see here. Brownwood is getting a replacement windmill and water tower. One's expected to last longer than original. On Monday afternoon, the Sumter Landing Community Development District voted 3-0 to zero to approve a bid of $126,756 with Mark Cook Builders to create a new structure from steel. The project's total cost is about $63,000 less than the initial estimate once design and demolition costs are factored in. The approval came after the project-wide advisory committee voted 7-2 to, to advise moving forward Monday morning Jerry Vicente, CDD7 chairman, and Jerry Ferlisi, CDD5 supervisor, voted no. Doesn't make any difference. They had a contractual agreement that it had to be replaced. So we're moving forward with that. The narrow width of the Lake Biona walking trail has officials bracing for potential complaints from residents. They're getting ready for ya. The tab for the trail, nicknamed the Million Dollar Mile, is estimated to top out at $840,000 and being paid for with amenity fees from residents of the villages living south of County Road 466. The trail is due for completion on September 23rd. However, a planned grand opening will have to be delayed due to heavy rain. We will have to push back the opening to allow the area to dry out. 
Property Management Bruce Brown told members of the project-wide advisory committee at their meeting Tuesday morning. PWAC member Steve Bova said he went out and measured the new trail, which had been proposed as a six-foot-wide path. He said the reality is that the path is only five feet wide, with ribbon curbing on both sides. He said that the five-foot of flexi pave path with the ribbon curbing adds up to six feet. What's the complaint? They said six foot, you got six foot. We're spending a lot of money here and I want to make sure we're getting what we pay for. Well, they're waiting for people to complain. I've seen the path. I've drove by it several times and I looked at it. And I got to tell you, when I first saw it, I told Sue, I said, well, it's nice. I said, but does that look a little narrow to you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't walk on these things, but I just thought it looked a little narrow. I'm trying to think about two fat guys out there walking, trying to pass one another. Somebody's turning sideways or stepping off the path. That's what I see. <laughs> Letters to the editor. A two-bedroom, two-bath villa, wait with a new gas-powered golf cart for only $99 per night. Sounds hard to beat. How about $84 a night for a three-bedroom, two-bath, ideal for housing up to six people? That gym, also with a golf cart, can be found in the village of Finney. It also boasts of an air fryer, ninja coffee maker, and built-in milk frother. Attractive offers like these advertised on rental services like Airbnb are bringing more and more people to the villages. But homeowners here in Florida's friendliest hometown are increasingly furious about the short-term rentals. Let me say before I go on with this, apparently you're not watching any of my videos over the past few years. I've talked about rentals in the villages and what to beware of. And if you're going to buy a home to rent it out, I always say, rent it out to age-appropriate people. Be kind to your neighbors. But if you turn it over to a rental company like most people do, all them rental companies care about is keeping that house full. That's all they care about. How do you think all these sexual predators are renting here in the villages? They're renting them homes off of the people that don't care. So if you're going to rent a home out, do yourself a favor. Do a background check on anybody that wants to rent your house and rent it out to age-appropriate people. When I say age-appropriate, I'm going to tell you right up front, 55 and over. There's no reason to rent a house here to a 25-year-old. Is it legal? Yes. Should you do it? That's the question, ain't it? Residents who live south of State Road 44 in the village of Chitty Chatty, Bradford, Hawkins, and St. Catherine are waking up to the reality of more and more short-term rentals in their neighborhoods. They offer descriptions of young people staying at the properties, rowdy parties, lack of concern about neighbors, and noise. One woman complained that a cheap rental in the villages is preferable to those who don't want to pay the high prices at Disney World. Last year, residents of Creekside Landing were horrified after a man barricaded himself into a short-term rental, prompting a standoff with a SWAT team from the Sumter County Sheriff's Office. Neighbors were ordered to stay in their homes for hours. District officials said the short-term rental contracts are not within the scope of the government control. What's your opinion on the flourishing short-term rentals here? I'm just going to simply say, I have no problem with rentals at all. Never did. I understand exactly why a lot of people are wanting to do that. Just do it correctly. The AAC decided in 2019 to remove the cap on amenity fees. However, some AAC members now believe it might be time to reinstate the cap. I think it would help, especially now. The highest monthly rate north of County Road 466 is currently $204. The AEC on Wednesday reviewed three financial scenarios with a deferral rate of $179,185,200. You can look at the presentation on those calculations at this link, Amenity Fee Deferral Rate. AEC members agreed that it is crucial to keep the AEC in a strong financial position. The AEC has $14 million in reserve funding and the bonds will be paid off in 2036. The members want to revisit the issue in October and look at a financial outlook. They should decide to set the deferral rate at $195. It's a big decision. It's an important decision. This is time to give our residents some relief somewhere. So tell me in the comments below, what do you think the AAC's action should be? What do you think the cap should be? 179, 185, 195? Or like some people believe, there should be no cap. This could be scary for a lot of people. A golf cart driver who suffered a medical episode created a frightening situation when he suddenly drove onto a town square in the villages. 
Never Never Band had been performing shortly after 8 p.m. Tuesday when the golf cart suddenly roared onto the dance floor at Lake Sumter Landing Marketplace. It was very frightening, said villager Marla Rima, who was in the crowd. There were several line dancers on the dance floor and they managed to get out of the way to escape any harm. 75-year-old man at the wheel at the golf cart suffered a medical episode, according to the sheriff's office. Several deputies immediately responded to the scene. The man had been accompanied to the square by a 70-year-old wife. A friend was able to come and pick up the couple. The golf cart was scared and remained at the square. Make sure you take the keys out of it. That could be frightening. I've never seen anything like that here. That's the first one I've seen. I haven't a seen woman it. had been drinking at a town square in the villages, was arrested after the alleged altercation. Linda K. Murphy, 73, had been at a town square on Friday night with a male companion when she had a couple of drinks and became intoxicated and belligerent. Her male companion drove Murphy's car to her home on Chalmar Drive in Fruitland Park because he had deemed her too intoxicated to drive. The man said that as he was driving Murphy home, she struck him in the arm several times. When they reached her home, she picked up a stand-up fan that was in the garage and threw it toward the vehicle. When a deputy arrived on the scene, he observed the fan was in several pieces on the floor. Murphy said the fight had been fueled by her financial situation and that she can't afford the cost of living. The Oklahoma native was arrested on a felony charge of battery on a person over the age of 65. He was booked at the Lake County Jail and released after posting a $1,000 bond. In 2018, Murphy had recently moved to the villages when she got lost after she had been drinking at Lake Sumter Landing. She was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence in the accident. Giovanni's Italian restaurant located in the Southern Trace Shopping Plaza is under new ownership as of June of this year. New owners are John and Filiberta Cristiona, who relocated here from Tampa, Florida. Giovanni's has been open for 18 years, and the new owners say they don't plan on changing a thing. They do say they will be offering a wider variety of specials in the future, as well as special discounts for veterans on special days. Men and women in uniform can expect a 10% discount on their purchases. They also now offer delivery through the DoorDash app. Who introduced himself to the community and celebrated 18 years of Giovanni's has been open on Saturday, September 10. All customers will receive a free glass of wine with the purchase of a dinner entree. They use a lot of garlic. That's all I got to say. If they use that much garlic, I'm... I'm just not a fan. More than 1,200 homes and six proposed developments were given the green light Tuesday at a meeting of the Wildwood Planning and Zoning Board. Special Magistrate Lindsay C. T. Colt recommended approval of comprehensive plan amendments and rezoning of four projects and site plans for two others. The Wildwood Commission could take final action on the developments later this month. The largest project is 100 Oaks west of 301 and about 1.3 miles south of the Florida Turnpike, where 407 homes are planned on 119 acres. A total of 133 school children are expected to be among the residents. A village of any resident claims a stoplight in his driveway is not a lawn ornament. <coughs> Home of Ricky Martino at 3210 Spanish Moss Way was a subject of a public hearing Thursday morning before the Community Development District 12 Board of Supervisors at Everglades Recreation Center. The 66-year-old testified before the board that he has a bad right eye and the stoplight is in place to assist him with his mobility disability. He said the stoplight cost him $1,800, has nothing to do with it, and assists him when he is parking. He said it has been in place for five years. Five years has nothing to do with it. I'm just saying that because these are all the excuses that you hear over and over and over again. And I'm just letting you guys know this has nothing to do with anything when it comes to a decision of what to do. A complaint about the law norm was received June 3rd by Community Standards. It was removed June the 8th. But another complaint was received June 13th, indicating that the stoplight has been back on display at Martino's home. The district office with its attorney online on August the 2nd attempted to explain the reason the stoplight was not considered a device for a disability and recommended other personal assistive devices to Martino rather than listening to the suggestions Martino just hung up. In speaking to the board on Thursday, Martino repeated his assertion that the stoplight is not a lawn ornament. He alleged lawn ornaments are openly on display at thousands of homes in CD12. Has nothing to do with it. There are birds, birth baths, and waterfalls everywhere, he said. He was clearly angry about the situation. They always are. 
I didn't build a half million dollar house to have people harass me. Sign a paper saying you'd follow the rules. Ford voted for to want you to deny his request for an accommodation and order to removal of the lawn ornament. Let me just go real quick and tell you what's going on here. All of the villages, that I know of anyway, is, is a complaint-based community. Do you guys know what that means? Because I'm going to tell you real quick if you don't. You can break every rule here until that first complaint. As soon as that first complaint comes in about something you're doing wrong or, or whatever the case may be, that's when everything starts. That's when the investigation starts. Pictures get sent in. That's when the, they send you letters. You'll be notified to make it right or you're going to be in trouble. Anything in the front yard that's visible from the street, if it's a complaint, just called lawn ornament. Lawn ornament means it's in the front yard. It's in the front part of the house. People can see it from the street. They're not going to allow it. Listen, take your stoplight, put it inside the garage. They won't say a word. You can do whatever you want inside, under roof of that house. That garage door is open. You see the stoplight when you're pulling in the garage. It'll assist you in there just as well. Just do that. That's all you can do. Uh, otherwise, take that stoplight and put it back in your lanai for decorations. They won't say a word of it back there. Why? They can't see it from the street. That's the only advice I'm going to give you. Community Development District 13 residents are asking many questions about being hit with a 6% maintenance assessment hike. Residents of Chitty Chatty, Bradford, Citrus Springs, St. Catherine, Hawkins, and other villages packed the CDD 13 Board of Supervisors meeting Thursday morning at the Everglades Recreation Center. Residents of Phase 1 and 2 in CDD 13 are seeing a 6% increase in their maintenance assessment. There is also a first-time maintenance assessment to be levied on the property in the new phase three. CDD 13's operating budget for fiscal year 2022 to 2023 has been set at $3.8 million. Because most residents of CDD 13 are still fairly new to villages friendly as Stormtown, many still don't fully understand how residents' maintenance assessments are used for landscaping in common areas and to support joint infrastructure. Joe Patasso of the Village of St. Catherine said that with all the new commercial development at Magnolia Plaza, he was curious as to why the burden on residents was increasing rather than decreasing. Commercial owners do not contribute to this? Question mark. The answer to his question was no. Commercial properties do not contribute to the upkeep of the residential areas. Resident Rocky Walker wanted to know about future growth of CDD 13. How much more development is coming to District 13? There was not a clear answer to that question. Several residents also complained about the quality of landscaping south of State Road 44. They said that the quality of landscaping is much better north of State Road 44. Well, real quick, uh, that's not fair because you've got new landscaping. They don't do a lot until the, until the landscaping takes root. They don't trim a lot of bushes. They don't do a lot of that because those are new plants and you can shock them to death. So they're waiting. They don't do a lot with the grass and stuff because it's new. Once it takes root, takes hold, then they'll start doing things things slowly. They did it here, they'll do it there. But to the rest of your questions, only thing I got to say, welcome to the villages. A national company has purchased two bowling alleys in the villages. Boro Corporation has announced that it has purchased Fiesta Bowl and Spanish Springs Lanes. Both bowling alleys in Florida's friendly hometown consist of 32 lanes and are home to both competitive and social leagues throughout the year. Bowling remains a high popular activity in the villages, but the bowling alleys in the Spanish Springs area are the only outlets for keglers here. The developer stopped building bowling alleys a long time ago. Bowler Corporation has more than 300 bowling centers across North America. Bowler Row Corporation serves more than 26 million guests each year through a family of brands that includes Bowler Row, Bowlmore Lanes, and AMF. In 2019, Bowler Row Corporation acquired the Professional Bowlers Association, the major league of bowling, which boasts thousands of members and millions of fans across the globe. Another acquisition announced this week by the company is Mel's Lone Star Lanes in Greater Austin, Texas. Uh, one bowling alley was smoking, and the other bowling alley was not smoking. And that's how we ended up with two bowling alleys up there. Interesting story, but true. Residents of the village of St. Catherine are concerned about speeding vehicles co-mingling with golf carts. Lawrence Smith, who lives in Rowdell Way, took his concerns Thursday morning before the Community Development District 13 Board of Supervisors. He said the golf cart lane disappears when the road reaches to St. Catherine Postal Station, forcing the carts and cars to share the roadway. He said the golf cart lane disappears when the road reaches to the St. Catherine Postal Station. There are no golf cart lanes, and you have vehicles and construction trucks traveling at 30 miles per hour. 
Smith also claimed many drivers are not obeying the speed limit. He said he checked with the Wildwood Police Department and confirmed that there are speeders in the area. He added that the 30 mile an hour speed limit is too fast. Somebody is going to get hurt. Deputy District Manager Kerry Duckett said the CDD 13 board has no enforcement powers with the regard of the roadways and does not regulate traffic control. She said the roads are owned and maintained by the city of Wildwood. And that is true. I've tried to explain this. Our roads are open to the public. These are not private roads. The village's developer does not own these roads and the residents do not own these roads. You're, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. And as far as speeders going through there, welcome to the villages. Every main road is what I call a through road. And I did several videos and mentioned this many, many times. I haven't mentioned it for a long time, but I said a long time ago, and this is just my opinion. You do what you want. I would never buy a house on a what I call a through street. What's a through street? Well, you can get a village's map. I used to sell them. I got a bunch of them over here. I'll probably just give some of them away here, but I used to sell them and mail them out to people help them out to look at things before they came down. If there's a major road that goes through your neighborhood from one end to the other, and it takes you to the postal station at the end of the street, to a shopping center at the end of the street, I would never buy a house on that road. That's just me telling you what I know. Kind of like I would never buy a house along the turnpike and then complain about the noise later. A villager was tracked down and jailed after skipping a court date in a theft case. Tina Marie Rosie, 57, of the village of Alhambra, was arrested this past Sunday by Sumter County Sheriff's deputies on a Lake County warrant charging her with failure to appear. She was transferred Tuesday to the Lake County Jail. Rosie had been arrested May 22nd on a misdemeanor charge of theft after attempting to steal a number of items from Walmart in Leesburg. Stolen merchandise which included Bud Light beer, Pepsi, bounty towels, and a Dutch oven. Bud Light beer, Pepsi, bounty towels, and a Dutch oven. I don't know. Had a total pre-tax value of $313, according to the arrest report from Leesburg Police Department of Virginia. Native skipped a court date, and a warrant was issued for her August the 18th. She appeared in Lake County Court on Tuesday and pleaded no contest. In the case, she was ordered to pay court costs in the amount of $473 and given credit for time already served behind bars. An erroneous suicide report led to the arrest of a villager's son. Sumter County Sheriff's deputies were called Thursday morning to Villa Vera Cruz in reference to a suicide threat. When, the, when they arrived on the scene, deputies found 38-year-old Scott Anthony Kennedy, who lives with his father in Villa Vera Cruz. Laying in the driveway of a neighbor's home, he told deputies... He feared his girlfriend had killed herself with a pistol inside the residence. He said she would not answer the door. An investigation revealed that she was inside the home and asleep. Kennedy became extremely irate and threatened the deputies. He was found to be in possession of marijuana. He was booked at the Sumter County Jail. There he was held without bond due to his being arrested and considered a probation violation. Last year, Kennedy was arrested after his red golf cart was spotted traveling on U.S. Highway 301. In addition, he had being convicted in 2002 in Nevada on charges of robbery with a deadly weapon and battery with a deadly weapon. What a cream puff. The repair of a sinkhole at the end of the residence driveway will cost Community Development District 4 board about $90,000. The sinkhole opened up in July on Wesley Street at a home in the village of Springdale. Bruce Brown of District Property Management on Friday updated the CDD 4 Board of Supervisors on the repair of the cost of the Springdale sinkhole. He said the grouting work should be completed on Monday. The total cost of the repair will be about $90,000. Two homes in CDD 4 were severely damaged by sinkholes in February 2018, residents of CDD4 were hit later that year with a 20% increase in their maintenance assessments to pay for repairs to infrastructure around that sinkhole site. Those repairs cost about $1.2 million. 
the Community Development District 3 Board of Supervisors has reluctantly agreed to forgive a $5,200 fine at a property that has been flipped. Previous owner Donald Terry Jr. has refused to pay the $5,200 in decompliance fines racked up at his former home at 1825 Sanibel Court in the village of Bel Air. He took ownership in that home in 2013 of his father's former home. He was the owner of the home the violations occurred. The home was sold in August of 2021 to Pernelli LLC for $215,000. Two months later, the home was resold to Jeffrey Wyatt for $309,500. Since then, the issue has occurred to CDD3 board. The others have tightened up their procedures, so decompliance fines will be recorded and will show up in a title search when a property changes hands. That hasn't been the case. The change was made after the Terry case already was set in motion. The board's attorney sent a demand letter to Terry who left a message for the attorney indicating, you ain't getting any money from me. <laughs> and the deal was done. I don't think you can force the guy to do anything unless you want to take him to court. There's nothing said that this guy even lives in Florida. If he lives in Florida, you ain't getting nobody extradited for that. There's no such thing, by the way, as a debtor's prison. None. Three Dog Night maintains an aggressive year-round touring schedule of over 90 dates a year, performing their hit build concerts for generations spanning the audience. The band's now famous name refers to native Australian hunters in the outback who huddled with their dogs for warmth on cold nights, the coldest being a Three Dog Night. Thus come the name. The legendary band Three Dog Night is coming to the villages, the band known for its hits, Mama Told Me Not To Come, Joy To The World, Black and White, Shambhala, and one will be performing at 7 p.m. December the 11th at Sharon L. Moore's Performing Arts Center. Get those tickets soon if you want to see them. Trust me on this. Within an hour or two of the ticket box opening up for sales, it will be sold out. The villager who was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence after a car crash sent her to a local emergency room. Denise Lehman Henrietta, 59, who lives on Tanbury Drive in the village of Bridgeport at Lake Sumter, was involved in a crash at 12.34 p.m. Thursday on Warm Springs Avenue in Coleman, according to the arrest report. The Missoula, Montana native got out of her vehicle and began to walk around, prompting the deputies to notice she was slightly unsteady on her feet. The report said when the deputy spoke to Henrietta, he noticed that she had had this strange odor of alcohol emitting from her breath. Henrietta participated in field sobriety exercise, leading the deputy to conclude she was impaired. During an inventory of her car, a coffee cream or bottle was found under the driver's seat. It contained a liquid which had the odor of alcohol. Henrietta was transported to the UF Health of the Village's Hospital ER at Brownwood when she consented to a blood draw as part of a DOI investigation. Six hours later, after she was released from the medical facility, she provided breast samples that registered 0.046 and 0.045 blood alcohol content. That's legal. She was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence and booked at Sumter County Detention Center. She was released after posting a $1,000 bond. Well, under the influence could be anything. Under the influence of pills. Under the influence of a foreign substance like cocaine. That's under the influence. A DWI is driving while intoxicated, which has alcohol. So, with her having a legal breast sample, uh, apparently he must have, he must have uh, suspended Suspected something else. Community, De De Community Development District Ford residents upset about a 20% maintenance assessment increase packed the Savannah Center. Residents from the Marion County section of the villages were at Friday's meeting of the CDD4 Board of Supervisors where the 22-23 budget was up for approval. The board was set to approve a $4.4 million budget representing a $754,265 increase over the previous fiscal year. CDD4 is in a unique position in the village as it is the only CDD which must pay for its road maintenance other than the Villa Roads. I believe the Villa Roads are still owned by the developer. The board had previously delayed some road maintenance, but supervisors concluded continuing to put off road repairs could prove more costly in the long run. CDD4 residents who received letters informing them of the proposed 20% increase came armed with plenty of accusations as well as questions. John Flood, a 19-year resident 
of the villages questioned the expenses incurred due to a failing underdrain system at the Sawyer Village, which has caused the roads to buckle. Why are we covering defects when the developer turns over the property to us? I want to know who is doing the inspections. Is it the family? John Douglas of the village of Springdale prefaced his remarks by stating how happy he is living in the villages. He said he is fortunate to be able to shoulder the 20% increase, but he said everyone is not so lucky. These people are living on fixed incomes. Money doesn't grow on trees. Supervisor said that 20% increase was unpleasant but necessary for the financial stability of CDD4. The budget, including the 20% increase, received unanimous approval from the board. There you go. To the editor, I am very surprised that Erin Collette was allowed to keep these murals on her garage door. When people who placed a metal bird in their landscaping are sanctioned if neighborhoods complain. As a former art teacher with a BFA in fine arts, I feel these doors are too gaudy and cheapen the look of the neighborhood. Imagine if everyone wanted to do this. She should paint her murals inside her home. I cannot believe this is allowed when simple metal yard ornaments are not. I am glad this house is not in my neighborhood. That is sent in by Cheryl Jordan from the village of Chitty Chatty. Well, Cheryl, I agree. I can't believe that it was loud either. I figured they would tell her if she had to take that off, period. And that gaudy fence down the driveway that's pink and blue. That's just my personal opinion. I can tell you that, like your neighborhood, under my deed restrictions, that's not happening here. But I don't live there, and it's her home. And if the deed restrictions there, which apparently allows it, which... Like I said, apparently it does. Then that's up to those people up there to handle their own district. So I just stay out of it. But I will tell you, that if I was going to buy another home for investment reasons or whatever, um, I'm not buying there just because of things like this. I mean, that's just my opinion about it. So thanks for sending everything in, though. I do appreciate it. <laughs>